Hi, good morning, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about some of these issues. I want to run you through some of the technical aspects and some of the perspectives from the research world, um, and I'll tell you where these things came from. Uh, just some terminology, just to make sure we're all on the same, same page. Uh, when you talk about agricultural climate change science, we normally talk about mitigation, which is reducing the impact of agriculture on climate, and that has to do with greenhouse gas management. And when you're talking about agriculture, the principal gas of concern is nitrous oxide, which is a byproduct of fertilization using nutrients, fertilizers, and so forth. It's also dealing with carbon sequestration. Uh, when you look at greenhouse gas management, you're, you're talking about not only effects on the environment, but you're also talking about an economic loss for the farmer. You know, you'd like to keep your nutrients within the agricultural box. Carbon sequestration relates a lot to soil health. Uh, healthy soils, more carbon, lots of other uh, associated good properties go with soils with, with soil carbon. So um, there's dual meaning in the concerns. Um, um, the other gas of concern is methane. Uh, many coming down to rice systems and livestock systems. The other half of the discussion deals with effects and adaptation. When we're looking at effects, we're talking about understanding the impact of climate on agriculture, the full systems of agriculture. And the adaptation part is uh, enabling sustainable agriculture under changing climate. And that means being able to deal with the negative effects and take advantage of any positive effects you might be able to realize out there. Um, so we normally talk about mitigation and then effects and adaptation. And um, the information I'll be presenting is um, primarily focused on the United States, but the principles apply worldwide. The source of uh, the information I'm presenting to you came out of this report, which in a moment of weakness I agreed to I agreed to head a couple years ago, and it was done as a technical reference for the National Climate Assessment chapter on agriculture. Now, this is the, the technical background for the discussions. Um, it's a science synthesis document, over 1,400 references. It's an update from the uh, SAP 4.3, which came out about 2008. Um, and it was supposed to provide the foundation for risk analysis and the National Climate Assessment, which was a separate document, which is, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with, a part of the General National Climate Assessment, which is mandated by Congress to be done every four years. Um, it was written to be a peer-reviewed desk reference. We went to great lengths to make sure it was readable, provided uh, many illustrations as possible, and all of the documentation. All of the references are listed, uh, minus a few that just didn't make it in. And uh, the important part of this thing is something I want to uh, reference and refer to later on, is that in the process of putting together this report, I wanted to create a community of scientists who were cross-disciplinary, so we could have some interesting exchanges that weren't focused on a specific narrow discipline talking about the topic. So it was... My scientists in the climate change program and a few others, water for example, um, about half of them were charged with finding non-ARS, meaning non-USDA co-authors to help them write this. So we went to universities and industry and we actually have a couple of international authors. So we ended up with over 55 authors and uh, we're pretty happy with how it came out. Um, you'll see at the bottom there's this other document, uh, that's the one we recommend for mitigation because we did not cover it in this report. So what about changing climate conditions? Well, this is a basic primer I'm sure you all know, but we're talking about changes in temperature, gradual increases, which, leading, which leads to longer growing seasons, less frost, warmer nights, things like that. Wide swings of temperature over short periods of time, I mean just you know, we, we've all experienced this in the last couple of years. Record high temperatures one day, record low temperatures two days later, okay? Precipitation changes, deficits, excesses, something that the, the mainstream press tends to miss. Um, that's all a part of climate change. Timing shifts, 
spatial shifts of where things happen, and then the changing mix of rain and snow, less snowfall, for example, upon which much of agriculture relies for water from the snow melt. We're also talking about an in increasing intensity of precipitation events. Uh, we no longer have as many of these slow, gentle rains that are so important to recharging groundwater and soil moisture. We have more fast-moving, intense events that dump a lot of rain and move through, which has major consequences for crop growth and the natural resources base. So we're getting more flooding, and at the same time, we're getting more droughts, as we're all aware of, around the world. The other factor of concern to agriculture is the increasing amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay, this has a number of effects on the crops themselves and on the agroecosystems. One of the key messages I'd like to get across with this slide is that um, it's the variability that is of growing concern as well as the rising temperatures. Uh, the Forest Service, for example, has been reporting rising nighttime temperatures for a long time. So the physiology of plants uh, in terms of what they're doing at night is uh, an important thing to start looking at. Just so you can say the USDA guy said it up front, water is the number one issue for agriculture in the 21st century. Not enough. Again, the drought situations are too much too fast. Okay, and this is uh, regional in the United States as well as around the world. Things shift. Timing and space and amounts. We talk about impacts of climate change on agriculture. We chose to look at it from two perspectives. The abiotic impacts, that's the temperature and the, the precipitation, for example, and then the biotic impacts. For the abiotic impacts, the things we're seeing are obviously plant stress, reductions in yield. Rice, for example, in Southeast Asia has kind of reached a plateau of production and is starting to fall off because of rising temperatures. Um, some scientists did some projections of this with their models a couple years ago. And if you remember, if you're local in the Washington Post, it had a, uh, uh, a series on the front page over several days that focused on rice production. And that was actually one of the things that was mentioned. Um, there's a concern with uh, pollination. The pollinators themselves, the shifting, if you're, if you're talking about um, changes of the timing of growing seasons when the pollinators emerge and are out there to do their their work for agriculture and the environment uh, that relative to when the crops have emerged while the air temperatures may be warming the soil temperatures may still be too cold to actually go ahead and plant and do something with it um, so there's a concern about that um, when you're talking about uh, drought very dry conditions, the concern is erosion, okay, which leads to air quality issues as well as a loss of the soil quality itself. Arizona, for example, has no farm days. You're not allowed to do anything. You can't till. You can't go out. So this may spread throughout other regions. Uh, in addition to that, too much water too fast, uh, you get erosion as well. The, the picture I have here in the lower left that is uh, one of our research plots in Missouri after a couple of days of intense rain a couple of years ago. This was sent in by one of our laboratories. Um, the whole issue of temperature and precipitation, especially precipitation, affects the human aspects of trying to cultivate. You can't get into the field. It's too wet. Uh, if you'll notice, most of the planting last year in the Great Plains, the entire Great Plains was done in 10 days. This is all also affecting things like harvest. That's why some of the machines are getting a little bigger and bigger. You'd like to get in and out and get as much harvested as fast as possible. When you're looking at these wide swings in precipitation events and things happen happening out of the normal sequence, the mean when you expect them, uh, I've talked to some producers that have seen rainfall events in the fall that they had never experienced and the, the rain fell on their crop and they were unable to get it out of the field fast enough so a fungus took over and pretty much what they didn't get to 
within a couple of days was lost. Water quality, obviously water is very important for agriculture, as I said, uh, all the erosion and whatnot from these increased intense rainfall events, you know, enough said, something that agriculture has been dealing with for a long time and actually starting to, to make some serious progress. Food quality, there are some studies out there that looked at the impact of uh, changing temperature and uh, drought stress, for example, on the quality of food. There are some changes going on. This is something that needs a lot of additional research. Um, we're seeing some uh, beneficial aspects and we're seeing some uh, detrimental aspects that I'll talk about in a minute. Animals, this chart in the upper right, well animals are just like human beings. There's a temperature humidity range at which they are comfortable and able to uh, function and live just like human beings. Some of the beneficial impacts, well there's reduced exposure to frost if you discount some of the wide variability issues. Uh, we have lower, longer growing seasons. Hopefully we can get it maybe a couple more crops, some varieties of crops with rotations. We do see some beneficial increased concentrations of beneficial compounds. Um, and uh, the slide on the lower right will show you this additional CO2 does tend to foster more biomass. Um, the slide on the lower right shows above ground and below ground biomass increases. Uh, also, with respect to pests, some will be warmed out of existence where they are residing right now and move. We're not sure how many will move or just extend their range, but we expect to see some movements. The biotic impacts. When you're talking about changes of precipitation and temperature, you're talking about changing habitats, which affects everything. Uh, the enhanced CO2 fertilization adds another element to it that makes it quite interesting because this enhanced CO2 acts like a fertilizer to some plants who, uh, for example, weeds in their genetic freedom, we haven't tweaked their genetic makeup. Uh, weeds, for example, many species have been able to take advantage of this CO2 and so we're seeing more weeds in places we've never seen them. We're seeing uh, different kinds of weeds in places we've never seen them. I talked to a gardener in Richmond, Virginia, and he said, after I gave this talk, and he said, you know, I'm seeing weeds in my garden I have never seen before in my life. And he was in his 70s, so he'd been gardening for a long time. Um, these changing habitats and this changing CO2 fertilization is affecting weeds, vines, invasive insects, pathogens, and animals. So they will, we're expecting some expansion of temporal and spatial ranges and their vigor. Um, in, in terms of invasives on rangelands, for example, in the upper right, there's a picture uh, kind of illustrating the insect effects of it. However, there's this thing called cheat grass, which is an invasive species which tends to be able to uh, survive in very dry conditions and makes a very good fuel for fire. So that's why we're seeing so much fire out in, say, rangelands in the West, for example. And you got to remember that 70% of the American West is in some kind of rangeland condition, and there's grazing on a lot of it. Uh, this additional CO2 is changing the carbon to nitrogen ratio, which has implications for the strength and the ability of the plants to stand upright. So we're seeing uh, some effects on lodging. And then my favorite part um, has to do with the lower left and the lower right illustrations. While we're seeing a flush of biomass with the additional CO2, the growth of this biomass is too fast for the nutrient supply to keep up with it. So there is a concern, for example, on western rangelands that you're getting a lot of biomass that's nutrient poor. So the ranchers are starting to wonder, well, are we going to have to provide supplemental nutrients for our cattle? My other favorite slide is the one on the lower right, which was done by Luziska, one of our co-authors that was here. And I forgot to mention, we have several co-authors from the report here, including Laura Lingnick. Um, Lou was uh, one of the first people to look at the effects of CO2 on weeds. He set up two chambers, the one on the left, was grown under ambient CO2 conditions. The one on the right was grown under future CO2 conditions at the time, what was expected for 2050. And he grew weeds. Of 
according to, to Lou, when you want to grow weeds, it's kind of hard to do, but he managed to get it done, and he treated the chamber on the left, which is the ambient one, with popular herbicide, Roundup, and uh, it did a very good job, as you can see. When he used it on the chamber on the right, that was future CO2 conditions, there was incredible resistance to it. So this has implications not only for the cost of farming, but for the use of agrochemicals. Looking at specific crops, looking at the literature, it was uh, very difficult to glean some of this information. We wanted to know what the limits of uh, production for a number of crops were, and as can be expected, a lot of scientists are reluctant to put an absolute temperature limit on things. For corn, the concerns are high nighttime temperatures, high temperatures during pollination and water stress. Soybean, same thing, water stress, high temperature. Wheat and small grains, the influence of extreme events, frost during flowering. Water stress, rice, temperature extremes, especially during pollination and water management, availability of water and the water quality. Cotton, high temperatures during bowl fill. Pasture and rangelands, the water stress issue, and then when you add the um, invasive species issue on top of it, it makes for an interesting ecosystem to be working with. Uh, fruit trees, chilling requirements. Many fruits need a period of cold to be able to produce. Chilling requirements not being met because of these rising temperatures, high temperatures during fruit development. And specialty crops, the issues of water crops and high temperatures in general, vegetables, and so forth. One of the themes that's been, that we see running through this are the high temperatures during reproductive parts of the growth cycle. And so this has uh, made a number of us start to think that, well, we need to be talking to our breeders to start looking at every stage of the growing season, reproductive and vegetative to be able to develop new varieties that are resilient to climate change. The increased biotic stresses, okay, the insect pests, greater numbers and generations increased insecticide resistance. If we're talking about longer growing seasons, you're probably talking about more generations of insects within a growing season. With each generation, you're probably going to see a little more increased resistance to some of the insecticides. Geographic ranges will increase and decrease depending on the species. This is one of the unknowns. Are some going to be warmed out of existence where they are, or are they just going to expand their ranges? And then since climate change and agriculture are a global phenomenon, uh, we can expect to see potential increases in imports of insects from uh, other countries. The Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, for example, is interested in being able to better project future climate because although the number of imports into the U.S. in terms of food have skyrocketed over the last 20 years, the number of inspectors that they have is almost stable. So that's one of the reasons they're looking at new types of technology and they'd like to be able to move their resources to specific ports when they know you have a greater probability of an insect from an area where there's an outbreak being imported. Pathogens. With these changing habitats, we're seeing concerns about host pathogen response changes. The signaling that goes on between plants and insects and plants and pathogens and the concern that um, comes to mind immediately are things like non-crop reservoirs. Kudzu, for example, it was imported as a ground cover plant uh, over 100 years ago and has seemed to have taken over the south, is now moving northward. And the concern is that um, without these long periods of cold that you need to knock back kudzu, um, that kudzu is an alternate host for soybean rust. So it complicates the issue considerably. Cultural control measures may be less reliable. Okay, same thing, you're getting stronger um, uh, pathogens, our ability to deal with them, it's going to take a little more thought. The concern is, once again, that cost of production. 
and the extreme events can spread. I mean, there have been studies over the years that talk about the movement of air masses with pathogens in them. Um, I remember one study that looked at the spread of, I think it might have been insects, but um, there was an air mass that moved from Texas into North Carolina and it brought some, some pests with it. So the same thing will happen with pathogens. As air masses move, if you have the introduction of the, of the agent, you know, they will move, especially with extreme events. Weeds, as I said before, the increased vigor and the herbicide resistance and the geographic range increases and decreases. The bottom line is these are the things that farmers and ranchers have to spend money on to deal with. So it's going to increase the cost of production. So you have the yield quantity and yield quality and the cost of production concerns. Livestock. Feeding them is a concern. Quantity and quality, as I said before, of the forage and grain and the associated production cost increase with that. There are other factors that, that affect the cost of this, as you well know, like biofuel. There's the animal heat and humidity stress. This table I showed earlier reduces growth, reproduction, and production, meat, dairy, and eggs. And uh, the obvious solution is, well, let's, you know, let's air condition them or put up fans and things like that. Well, there goes your energy cost for production right there. Um, we may see some shifts in where production goes to because of things like that. Uh, disease and pests for livestock, there are already some examples. Uh, blue tongue, for example, moving out of Africa into southern Europe. Uh, frequency, intensity, and distributions of, of some of these issues are changing. And then there's the abundance and or distribution of the competitors, predators, and parasites of vectors themselves. There have been some changes in the theories of um, invasives that have been done that not only look at the nutrient or resource availability, but also the lack of enemies on uh, the species as they spread. So it makes for some interesting things to look at. Responses of the agricultural systems. One thing you need to realize about farming, that especially in the U.S., it's a very, very complex socioeconomic and environmental system. Um, we expect to see changes in farmer behavior and uh, more attention to climate extremes versus only means. The prevailing thought in most farming is that you're expecting an average situation. Uh, the only advice I give to farmers right now is start paying attention to the potential for more extremes of temperature and precipitation. Um, farmers are pretty resourceful when it comes to dealing with issues. Some of them will be uh, just looking at things like it's a common sense type of situation. I talked to one farmer and I asked him, you know, have, have you been doing anything to deal with this crazy weather that's out there right now? And he says, well, yeah, I live along the Missouri River. I got flooded last year, so I'm building berms. Okay, there's some simple solutions out there. However, as time goes on, things are going to get a little more complicated and it's going to go beyond the ability of the farmer to deal with it. Um, we're going to see changes in production, consumption, price, and trade patterns that will affect the responses. Um, once again, the domestic and global market response. It will create some opportunities and some challenges. And uh, the U.S. impacts of, of some of these challenges out there will depend on the global response. The, miss, the mix of economics and social systems. Um, and the economic effects, as can be expected, depend on domestic and global adaptive capacity. And these impacts will vary by region, by sector, and by group. Some of these things, because they are regional in nature, when the, the general statistics, statistics are reported, sometimes get masked. Extreme events. Uh, these are the types of things that hit the news most often, so the general public sees this in terms of its impact on agriculture. Um, if you look at the insurance records for the last 10 or 15 years that the industry, the insurance industry puts out, it typically puts out a table that says, here's the year, here's the event, you know, here's where it happened, here's the economic impact, and here's the sector that was hit the hardest. If you look at these tables, agriculture is coming up more and more with larger and larger amounts of economic impact. And you have to remember that although, although an extreme event uh, have been, uh, the occurrence of extreme events have been shown to be more probable, 
than say 40 or 50 years ago, uh, you cannot attribute any single event to climate change. So therein lies part of the, the difficulty with communication. You just have to wait long enough to see if it is part of a pattern. The effects and adaptation take home messages. These effects will intensify beyond 20 or 30 years. The resourcefulness of the farmer will be insufficient to really be able to deal with these things down the line. The effects will continue, both abiotic and biotic, and there will be effects or impacts on yield quantity and yield quality, that nutritional value. The cost of production will be affected. There's the law of what I call generations. Future farmer, farming and farmers will be facing a different climate than their forefathers and foremothers have been able to, to uh, successfully farm under. And so there's little in terms of experience to pass along. It's going to be very different. It's going to affect risk management. There will be more climate and weather in their decision making. The natural resources basis is something we tried to bring out into the report. The natural resources basis, the soil, the water, and the air necessary for agriculture production are also at risk. Ecosystem services, something we never um, think much about, pollinators and biodiversity on the landscape, some of these ecosystem services that we, we acknowledge periodically that rural landscapes provide for society as a whole are going to be affected. The watershed, the air shed, and so forth. So there will be uh, concerns about what's going on out there from a larger perspective for societal benefits. And so some of the key words, variability. I think we need to be talking more about the variability impacts, especially extreme events and the duration of these events. Um, one of the co-authors of the report was a climate scientist working with us. And so when the lead author team had some discussions, we would have these things like discussions and he'd ask, well, what type of information do you need? And we'd say, well, we need humidity and, you know, uh, probability of this or that type of a rainfall event or snow. He says, yeah, we can give you that. And then we started talking about what's the probability of a cold snap below a certain temperature occurring for, say, three days and then a record high temperature snap after that. He said, we can't do that right now. So the types of information um, we're after right now um, concerns the ability to forecast variability and the duration of events of the future. And then when it comes down to the crop itself, well, we need to be looking at all stages of growth and reproduction to deal with it. So one of the reasons I did this report was because working in the world of mitigation of climate change with agriculture, that science is, is pretty well developed. There have been some good, good papers out. Uh, there's been some good long-term efforts, our own GraceNet effort, uh, the CHASMs that came out of the KSU, the University Consortium for Greenhouse Gas is in Agriculture. And so that science is pretty well developed. There was a recently a report put out by uh, USDA. It's a USDA report 1939. It's basically a catalog of options for producers when they're seeking to deal with uh, managing their greenhouse gases and, and carbon sequestration. However, adaptation is all over the place. We have bits and pieces. Okay, how do you put it together to make a decision? How do we approach it from a research standpoint? And fortunately, in the process of going through the literature, the IPCC offers an example of a way to move forward. And that's through the concept of vulnerability. Now, they define vulnerability almost like an equation. It's a function of the exposure and what parts of agriculture and the agricultural system are exposed to climate change. And that means extremes as well as changes in the means. Plus the sensitivity. What are the critical thresholds in the interactions that are important? This is where things like the Agricultural Modeling Intercomparison and Improvement Project come in. Uh, AgMIP is a, an effort, it's a worldwide effort to bring together all the crop modelers to start working together and improve all of the models to move forward. 
because when it comes to crop models, to being able to predict yield and, and uh, just growth, some of them work well under some situations and other ones work well under other situations. And so the idea was let's move them all forward, not necessarily moving towards one end all model, but let's move them all forward and being able to run an ensemble approach the same way the weather community does. They, when, you're, when you get a projection and uh, the visual impact I think of when it comes to an ensemble approach is uh, the track of say a hurricane they run the weather models in the forward direction to project where, say, the, the hurricane is going to go. When you're running a bunch of models, you'll get a, a, a central tendency where everything agrees and you figure, okay, we're pretty sure where that's going to go. But as time goes out, the, the range, the spatial range gets broader and broader. Well, the idea is to do the same thing with crop growth models and then link that ensemble approach with the ensemble approach of running the climate models and hopefully get better estimates for what's going to happen to crop growth and yield in the future. So that's where the sensitivity comes in. Finally, the other part of vulnerability has to do with adaptive capacity. Resilient systems, and that means climate ready crops and production systems. One of the things we looked at and determined that was a concern out of this report that there's an overemphasis on genetics as a solution to dealing with climate change. And so we started thinking about the, the genetics and environment interaction and we thought, well, management plays a very, very important part in actually getting a crop. So we started talking about G by E by M, the interaction of genetics with environment and management as a solution to this. Uh, there, are some, there are some examples out there from the last couple of years. In Iowa, the major drought of a couple of years ago, the seed companies rolled out some very impressive drought tolerant varieties. However, in a number of locations, the traditional varieties did better than the drought tolerant varieties because of the way they were farmed, the way the soil was dealt with. Low till, no till to maintain what little soil moisture was there um, in the places where you had traditional varieties and places where you had the new varieties, the drought uh, tolerant varieties. The traditional varieties did better than the new varieties because of the way they were managed. So this genetics by environment by management is focused on the interactions. Can we, say, develop varieties for specific management situations? We're already doing it for environments. Can we match management solutions with various types of varieties to get a boost from the synergy of the two? This is going to take some cross or transdisciplinary approaches, putting together teams, not an easy thing to do if you're a scientist. We're trained within our specialties and we don't talk to the people in the next office a lot of the times. Um, the G by E by M is catching on with the scientific world. The producers also like it because it, they think of it in terms of, well, that's the decision making I have to do. I have to be able to pick a variety for the environment, and I have to get information about what the environment's going to be. I know what my soil is, I know what my terrain is, you know, I've been dealing with the means for my environment, okay, so our messages start looking at, at the, the variances of it. And then I have to make decisions about management. When am I going to plant it? How am I going to plant it? How dense? How deep? What type of fertilizer? What type of water? And so forth. What, how am I going to deal with pests and things like that? So they really like this G by E by M. Um, and it basically comes down to looking at what's called the yield gap. If you're talking about genetic improvements, those are done um, with a benchmark of producing new varieties that are, um, can reach a certain yield under conditions where there's no limiting factors. In reality, the farmer has to deal with a lot of limiting factors. Okay, the weather varies. Um, trying to catch the right time for, for water application or fertilizer application. You know, were you able to, to take advantage of the, the, uh, you know, the natural qualities of the soil there? And so 
the potential is a whole lot more than what the farmer actually gets, the farmer yield. So that difference between the potential and what the farmers get is what we're calling yield gap. So basically our point is, and I believe uh, Kenneth Kasman, who's a speaker here later on in this conference, uh, is the one who actually brought our attention to the yield gap. What it comes down to is management of soils. When you're talking about management, which is timely as there's a, a greater call for attention to the role of soils uh, as a societal benefit, not just for food production, but for those ecosystem services. When you look at the full system outside of the production system, you can add a P to this G by E by M, which has to do with post-production parts of the system. Food safety, transportation issues, uh, processing, you know, what happens to the crop or, you know, animal product that you, that you're harvested from the production system. What happens between then and when it gets to the, ex to the table when somebody consumes it? So there are some major questions on the effect of the post-production issues on food quantity and quality that can play well within G by E by M. But, you know, being a dumb scientist, I'm just going to deal with G by E by M right now instead of G by E by M by P because uh, that's where we are. Bottom line is collaborations are essential. Cross-disciplinary talks. If you ask a scientist to deal with an issue, they'll sit down, use their training, and say, well, this is how I would approach it. I did most of my research in remote sensing, so everything boils down to a remote sensing issue. If you ask a, a geneticist, they'll say, well, you know, I can develop a, a, a variety that will deal with this. In reality, what the G by E by M is telling us is that all of us need to sit down. The soil scientist needs to sit down with the agronomist, with the, uh, the, the breeder, and then people like me who do monitoring and measurements and things to give you feedback on the production process. So this whole collaboration across disciplinary lines, which is actually a lot of fun when you do it from a scientist's perspective. So what are we going to do when we get all this stuff together? How are we going to make decisions? Well, once again, I'm thinking, looking at it from the scientific perspective as well as that of the producer, I'm thinking maybe a decision tree is a way to do it. And uh, when you're talking about G by E by M, you know, you have to start somewhere. I'm here. I'm going to grow this. What's next? And you have options. It's all about options when you're talking about agriculture. Producers are ind independent people. They live in different regions, so they need to be able to adapt. They need to have options to be able to adapt to maintain that economic viability. So a big question for the research world is what are the model, forecasts, and data needs at each decision point? This is where big data and models come in, okay? And there's a, a lack of a lot of foundational data out there that we need to be getting to help us make these types of decisions. Finally, my last slide. Climate change is ultimately a, a challenge to agricultural sustainability. Um, the definition I like for agricultural sustainability was put forth by the National Academy of Sciences in their large 2010 document really good report. You can download the executive summary up front. And what they did was they defined agricultural sustainability in terms of the goals of sustainability. And those four goals they looked at in terms of satisfying human needs for food, feed, fiber, and now contributions to biofuel. Enhancing the environmental quality. We have to maintain the resource base. Sustain the economic viability of agriculture. Farmers and ranchers and land managers have to stay in business. We have to produce economically viable ways of producing food. And then enhancing the quality of life for farmers, farm workers, and society as a whole. Anybody talk to a dairy farmer who farmed like 20 years ago? Ask them how many times they took a vacation in their lifetime? You know, you might say, yeah, I had a day off in 19, uh, you know, so forth. So, we have to look at these systems in terms of the quality of life for the rural populations and opportunities and what it does for society as a whole. The nice thing I like about this approach is that each one of these goals, human needs, environmental quality, and economic viability, and quality of life can be 
quantified. You can put a number on it. So it provides an opportunity for metrics to see how well we're doing. So with that, I close. Thank you.